Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth uh, recruitment masterclass in our series of six masterclass events. Um, as you can tell this week, uh, slightly different, we're not coming to you live unfortunately. unfortunately. Um, we're a small team and so some sickness absence has uh, had an impact on how we're best able to deliver this session. Um, so I hope you'll understand that we're uh, recording it in advance and sharing it with you in this format instead. Uh, just as a reminder that uh, this week our topic is onboarding. Uh, so in the weeks previously, we've run through how to prepare a recruitment process, how to design the role that we want to hire for, how to write a really good job advert to get those applicants coming through. We then work through uh, interviews and assessments and different ways that we can uh, approach making the right decision about who to hire. And this week, as we move on to onboarding, we're now thinking about how we can welcome that new hire, that person that we've selected into our team for the first time and make that process of them joining as smooth and effective as possible. Uh, this week, we're joined by my uh, colleague, Ed Jennings. Ed is the Chief of Staff here at Matt Nursery Life. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that uh, role, uh, he works closely alongside me as CEO, um, helping to um, lead the business um, and works across uh, all areas of the company. Um, but he's joining us today because he's uh, done a, a important piece of work for us recently on our own onboarding how we welcome people into the TNL team. Um, and uh, we've shared a lot of that best practice, um, a lot of that experience in uh, the chapters of the Ultimate Guide on, on onboarding. And so it's great to have Ed with us today to uh, share his expertise in person. So Ed, maybe before we uh, get into it properly, you could start off by just giving everyone a little bit of a, a background on yourself and how you came to join TNL. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Sam. Um, well, my name is uh, Ed Jennings. Um, I have been with TNL for um, just over, I think coming up to four months now, uh, so I can't claim to be the, the new person anymore, but um, very, very excited to join a new industry uh, and learn about the, the early years sector. Um, in terms of my background, so um, I'm best known for working and driving um, strategic and innovative change, so I'm a man who wears many hats. Um, and, and jumps into lots of different uh, teams of various sizes. So I've been fortunate enough to work with um, large organizations across the globe, um, in the UK, um, US and across Europe, in teams of uh, up to six and a half thousand, um, to leading smaller teams as well, um, of uh, 12 as well. So um, I've got quite a, quite a mixed bag in, in kind of leadership and team management, um, and in terms of industries, I've worked across multiple, so I spent a lot of time in the travel and tourism and hospitality sector, uh, moving into technology and e-commerce, and um, yes, most recently moving into the early years sector uh, as well. So um, really, really exciting time. And um, yeah, I've been, been very lucky to work with some amazing companies and work for some amazing brands. So worked very closely with the likes of uh, Disney to uh, Microsoft. Uh, to most recently um, helping create a uh, new business last year during the pandemic, which was um, a hospitality business shipping uh, bottles all over the world. So we went from one to 30,000 a week. Um, so yes, I've had my fair share of onboarding um, in Teams. For me, this is the most crucial stage actually of it all because uh, you best get to know your candidate and you best get to prepare them for um, the, the the future in your organisation. So really excited to be here and to be talking about um, onboarding today. Fantastic. Thanks, Ed. Um, so I think as a, a starting point, um, it's perhaps worth us unpacking a little bit what we mean by onboarding. Uh, it's a term that, that you and I use uh, a lot, but it, it's one of those words that I think for some people might be a bit of a you know Silicon Valley startup type term. Yeah. Um, it might, might also, people might be more familiar with thinking about it uh, in terms of uh, an induction process. Um, or just just welcoming people to their team, um, and I think it it's a similar challenge that, that I've talked to all of the guests um, so far in this series about, which is the the pressure of recruitment in early years specifically. That generally, when we're hiring new staff to join the team, um, we're doing that to fill a gap in the team, and that that gap in the team has real operational impacts because of the the statutory ratios that we have to meet between staff and children, um, and so I think often once we've gone through all of that hard slog, all of those things that we've covered over recent weeks um, through that recruitment process, by the time we get to the person actually starting on their first day, all we want is for them to get out on the floor, start engaging with the children and, and being part of that ratio 
often because that means that uh, as the the manager or, or the leader in the team that's done the recruitment finally that means that we can step back from that hands-on work and get back to our normal role um because mm -hmm. the team is is properly resourced again um but i think again in common with the the things that we've talked about a lot over the recent weeks that is a, a bit of a um a false benefit you know that sense of just rushing and getting people out there straight away might feel like you're getting getting benefit from them more quickly but actually hurrying people's onboarding hurrying their welcome to the team can have longer term impacts that um can come back to to bite you i think yeah um, i would def definitely agree i think from an onboarding perspective um you know people say it is welcoming to the team reduction you're absolutely right actually those are part of the bigger topic which is onboarding yeah, uh, onboarding absolutely. doesn't start um on day one when they start their new role um that is, in essence, you're welcome to the team, or that is potentially the start of their induction. But that is a step within onboarding further down the journey. So um, onboarding, in essence, is the journey from the moment the person, I would say, signs the contract with you to probably the end of their well, probation, I would say, mm -hmm. um, which typically is somewhere between one month or, or three months from joining the new uh the new company setting organization so um it really is that end-to-end -end journey um from the moment the contract signed to the you are now a full-time uh or part-time employee but you are a permanent member of this team and that is the journey so there are lots of steps which i'm sure we'll talk through today and i know is covered within within this chapter um but yes that is in essence what onboarding is it is the overall journey from day one signing contract to the end of your probation period absolutely um and you yeah you mentioned uh, this chapter so again just uh, as a reminder for people uh, as always this masterclass session uh, goes hand in hand with the next chapter of our ultimate guide to early years recruitment um, you can access that uh, on that nurserylife.com through your premium resources library um, and as always this chapter is uh, chock full of uh, both detailed information some case studies interviews but also those uh, practical tools and templates that you can just pick up and use right away. Um, and I know that one element that's included in this chapter, uh, and, and Ed is something that I know you've been instrumental in preparing, is that a kind of timeline um, covering that that period between someone accepting the job and their first day, um, which, like you say, is all, cr again, critical parts of onboarding and, and what that process can look like in the, the days running up to, to their first day. Um, perhaps you can just give a few highlights of, you know, and again, drawing on what what we do internally at TNL, what what, uh, yeah, what what happens in that period? Because um, people may be wondering what what you can fill fill that time with. Sure. So, um, like I said, it starts the moment they've signed the contract. So, <clears throat> what I always like to do is put myself in their shoes, or in the travel industry, we used to say put ourselves in their flip flops. And um, really, the idea behind that is to understand what that other person is feeling. Now, we've all been new to different companies and different settings, and we've all had that moment from receiving the offer to signing the contract. And we go through a bit of a curve, don't we? We go through the uh, pure excitement and celebration, and then we go to, oh my gosh, I'm starting somewhere new in a few weeks or next week. What do I wear? What do I do? Um, who am I meeting? What is my first few days going to look like? What if I hate it? What if I don't like the people I'm working with? Um, what if I don't like the company? And those questions should be answered before they even start. And that, that's the key really is once they have signed the contract with you, you should have a transition of communication up until the point they join day one. So in essence, that individual has um you know understood what what the company is and what it stands for and what the setting is and what it stands for what its values are and why it's unique and maybe stands out to other settings um every company tends to have principles or values um and that's something that should be shared almost from day one um so for me it very much is a those steps up until day one are you're hired congratulations we're really excited to work with you, which can be done through email communication or through a phone call um, to a, you know, a, a great idea is doing a welcome video from your um, your owner, uh, the owner of the company, 
um, the hero of the company who might deliver your, you know, your messaging or your updates to everyone in their settings. So um, that's a really crucial part is, you know, having that almost personalization um, of saying, we're very excited for you to join the team. Congratulations. Let's tell you a little bit about who we are, what we are and what we do and what we're aspiring to do maybe as well. And then yeah, ultimately, I yeah. I, I was going to say that, yeah, so in, in our in our team, that video is from me. And, you know, that's something that I recorded several months ago and that, that we use um, all the time. And I guess, you know, we'll do a new version of um, every year or so to kind of keep it um, broadly up to date. So it doesn't need to be something that you do manually every time. Um, and I think I'd especially encourage, you know, it sounds like a bit of a, a big company thing to do, you know, that, you know, TNL, we, I'm, I'm called the CEO. That's, that sounds like a sort of CEO type thing to do. But I think actually, you know, it's, it's something that's really valuable and really personable that you can do in an organization of any size. Even if you're a, you know, a child minder hiring your first assistant, um, just taking the time to, you know, get across your, your passion and, and, you know, why you're bringing on a first person to work with them. Or if you're, you know, a manager in a, a, a small, you know, committee run setting where there isn't that kind of own a figure in the same way, go ahead and do it yourself, you know, give give that, you know, two, three, four minute little video of uh, just breaking down that formality from the recruitment process, you know, when you're very much the, the one doing the interviewing, asking the questions, being quite reserved because you haven't made a, de made a decision yet about who you're going to hire, use that, making that video as that opportunity to switch around from recruiter mode to welcoming manager mode um, and sort of start bringing people into the fold in that way. Yeah, absolutely agree. It, it's team size is absolutely irrelevant. And some of what I'm saying might sound incredibly corporate, but I promise you this works beautifully, whether you're in a team of 30,000 to a team of five or 10, it, it's irrelevant. Every single person will go on the exact same journey and emotions in their shoes, putting yourselves in their shoes um, before they start day one. It, it doesn't matter of the size. So. Um, these these steps are really important. There are other things we 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 do and that work really well, um, such as a lot of when you join a big company, you get a huge employee handbook. Lots of the time, it's 50, 60 pages long. I've I've had it in small companies of forty employees as well. I get a huge handbook, and um, that's not really a great first impression. I think nor do people really read through it, or the purpose of you writing it to give people the information. Um, potentially isn't presented in the right way or an engaging way. Um, so one of the things that we've done, uh, which has worked very well, is we send through, um, just after the uh, employee's been hired, we send through uh, a one pager. And basically it's split up into short snappy boxes. And it's to answer these questions, some of the ones I mentioned earlier. So it's things like, what do we wear on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, holiday allowance, what, how does that work? Um, when do I get paid? You know, these things a lot of the time that you want to ask and every single person wants to know, but you don't feel comfortable about asking until you've got there or until maybe you've got a buddy or you've got an ally inside um, on your first day. So that that's another thing that um, has worked very well is just having that one pager. And inclusive in that is the most common questions we all probably want to know when we join an organization or a company or a setting. Um, but also, you know, potentially any benefits um, that, that might be there um, as part of working in that setting. And again, that can be that can be absolutely anything from an unlimited daily biscuit um, corner, as an example, or an unlimited daily snack corner. Or um, it could be a monthly team social, as an example, which, again, is something you all really want to know. How do I get to know other people uh, or maybe from other settings? So that one pager really, really helps in terms of answering those key questions, <clears throat> re-endorsing the benefits. Um, and ultimately, it's almost a bit of a reminder that <clears throat> through onboarding, it is a two-way partnership. And this is not a one-way communication and a one-way relationship. We employ you and that's that. Um, this person who you've recruited can go and recruit themselves anywhere. They can apply for anywhere they want. And they've chosen to apply for you. So you should be selling yourselves just as much and telling them why you are great to work for from the outset and in the build up to day one. So by the time they've come to you on day one, they know a headline of what the company's about, what their benefits are, 
And you've answered those key questions that they've probably got in their head that they may or may not want to answer. Um, and then, of course, we follow that with the CEO video, which is a really nice touch um, to kind of build a bit more of a personal relationship, but show this is where we are. This is where we're going. This is what we we stand to do um, as a setting or, or as a business. And again, it's a really nice human welcome in the build up to day one again. I think also for me, there's a real value in um, in the visual side of it. So whether it's a video or whether you just send through, you know, a nice, um, again, a, you know, one page with everyone's names and photos. I, I, you know, there's nothing more uncomfortable than arriving for your first day at work and and not really knowing, you know, the person that answers the door is this, you know, uh, an apprentice? Is this someone I'm going to be working with or working for? Or, you know, that that sort of spinning sensation of all of the the different new people that you need to meet. I think there's real value in helping people recognize at least some of the key the key people you know so even if it's not your whole staff team if you're in a bigger setting but sharing you know the the names and photos and maybe just a couple of words of um sort of informal who they are um can be really valuable so that you know someone coming in on their first day goes oh yeah i remember that's that's you know so and so the deputy manager or that's the the baby room leader or whoever it might be um to just again like like you said Ed, starting off kind of um putting your putting yourself in people's shoes and, and thinking about you know when you start a new role what you would have loved to know um, and trying to make that as smooth as possible yeah um, and in that scenario you just gave there sam mm -hmm. which i think is a great one around your first day you knock at the door there's nothing more embarrassing or worse as a new recruit when you get to the door and you're quickly checking the name because you've never met the person of the person you're meant to mm -hmm. be meeting if you've got that name i've had times where i've not had that name and i've had to yeah. knock on the door and say Hi, I'm I'm here for my first day, and there's nothing worse than the person answering that door and go, "Sorry, who are you? Or yeah. what what's your name? Or who are you here to see?" If if that happens, then you're really doing something wrong. Um, you know, again, put yourselves in their shoes, and ultimately, they need to have that journey laid out for them. And the more you do it in advance or break it down in communications with them weekly, the smoother that onboarding process will be. And I'm I'm sure we'll talk about the benefits of onboarding. Um, a little bit later, but it is also on the flip side, just as important for the team, because if a team member who already works for you answers that door and <laughs> they have no clue who this new person is, I promise you, you will feel or that person will feel just as embarrassed yeah, um, from the outset. So the suggestion there that um, you just made, Sam, is actually a great one. Uh, and again, it's something we, we've also incorporated into our own onboarding is up front, we, um, we, we've created uh, almost a little bio of each member of the team and a picture. And it's not just a, I've been in this industry for 15 years. I've worked in this place, this place, this place. It is personal interests of these individuals that they're happy to share that provoke conversation um, or potentially the new person might find something relatable. So you might have, you know, someone who likes to knit or someone who might likes to swim or yoga. And if you as the new, um, you know, the new starter come in and see that in advance, you'll be like, oh, great, I'm definitely going to get on with this person because I love yoga too. And I absolutely love to swim. So um, actually making sure you do, I would say bios about the new people joining on both sides that are personable, yeah. um, also create significant value because both sides have a bit of nervousness when a new person joins. Absolutely. OK, so um, I think we've given a good a good overall sense there of what what we're talking about when we talk about onboarding and, and some of the key elements. Um, and I think we've we've covered quite well that pre pre the first day um, phase, thinking then about that more traditional induction. You know, once once someone has has knocked on the door and they've started their first day, what uh, what sort of things do you think are um, are most important to cover, and perhaps crucially, what what order? You know, where where do you start when they've they've knocked on that door and they've come in? Where does the process go from that point? Well, first of all, you need to think about who is the person who is delivering this induction. Yeah. Um, that is probably the most crucial first step for day one. Um, so, in advance of that, the new starter joining, it, it's a really good idea to just give them that calendar. Um, of, you know, here's a headline overview of what your first few days look like. Again, making the new person joining feel comfortable, but also sharing that with the rest of the team because they will embrace the new person a, a lot more. Yeah. Um, but 
yeah, choosing um, the right person to deliver it is really important. So, for example, just, sorry, yeah. I'm just going to pick up there on um, you know that that schedule again. A, a thing a bit more peculiar to early is I think really valuable is you know almost on that schedule blocking out in in two colours when someone is a new person is in ratio or out of ratio. You know, there's going to be those periods where a new person has started. They're going to be spending you know a fair amount of time in the office or in the staff room going through those policies and those things that that people have to do when they first join a setting. And then they're going to be spending, you know, hopefully plenty of time out on the floor. But it's probably going to be quite clear to their manager or the person doing that induction, you know, when they're training, when they're learning and they're not being counted in the ratio versus when they are being counted in the ratio for the first time. And they're sort of, you know, getting getting underway properly. And it, it could be really challenging for others in the team to see a new person out on the floor, perhaps looking like they're working normally, but actually not knowing whether to expect them to change nappies or to yeah. you know be able to take a group of children outside so giving again that two-sided really clear visibility of that calendar that you know they're going to start on this day they're going to spend the morning in the office with with the manager going across stuff they're going to spend the afternoon on the floor but they're not going to be in ratio the next day they're going to do you know uh, a couple of hours in each of the other rooms and then they're going to spend the afternoon in their room and they're going to be in ratio for the first time or whatever it might be um and and making it yeah that that clarity for for both the existing staff and the new person is really important. And it's very easy as a manager or a leader to forget that and to forget yeah. how everybody feels. And exactly that is why it is so important to think of both sides. Um, because yeah, one one team will absolutely feel uncomfortable if they haven't been communicated to versus the new person or vice versa. So yeah, it, it's really easy to forget that. And it's important that that's not forgotten. And again, it's communicated in advance, not on the day when this new person shows up. It needs to be yeah. proactive, not reactive. Uh, so yeah, so just um, on, on the person delivering it, um, my, my preference is always not to have the manager of the new recruit to be the one who's delivering it um, for quite a number of reasons. Um, I, I would say the big thing is have someone consistently uh, trained in your team who can deliver onboarding who can deliver that um, initial introduction to the team, which we'll, um, we'll talk through a bit of what a great schedule might look like, and ultimately almost acts as a buddy, um, particularly if that person is joining uh, on their own and not with someone else and can buddy up with them. But that person almost becomes um, you know, a, a, a support for that individual throughout the process and builds a relationship. So I would always recommend it. It's not the direct manager of the employee um that's joining um and i think what, what a really great a great way to do it is is to have that initial session which is a uh, a relationship building so you know we all uh, know and love icebreakers i say that with a slight hint of sarcasm um but they actually work really well to get to know the person and have a bit of a conversation so i always like to start start um the day one induction as a getting to know you and you getting to know us. So revisiting some of those pieces that we've sent out already in the build up from the moment they've signed the contract to joining the team. Um, <clears throat> and also just having a, a human conversation, getting to know each other. Um, what do you like to do on the weekends? You know, what did you do pre pandemic? Um, how do you like to fill your time? Um, those things are really important to building that personable relationship. And then in, and then taking through really what the onboarding uh, looks like. And that is um, an initial view of the next couple of days, how it will work and going into the uh, probation period up until the end. So initial view is really important and give them the plan of what's gonna happen in a bit more detail. And then from there, um, <clears throat> I think it's really important just to go into the, um, you know, what what do we stand for as a, a company or, um, you know, what are our values? What do we talk about as, as a team and what's important to us as a, uh, as a, as a company? Um, that, that's really important because ultimately that's what sets you apart from your competitors. And ultimately, yeah. I'm sure they'll learn and have questions about that as well. I think um, um, avoiding getting too into the, the detail too quickly is a really important lesson there, you know, that is, again, very easy. You've got someone coming in, potentially they're coming into a setting, they're going to be a uh, a key person they're going to have a group of key children um you know it, your your instinct can to be straight away you know oh well here, here are your key children let's let's introduce all of them 
yeah. actually there's yeah even if it's just taking you know an hour an hour and a half first to give that overall you know who are we as an organization who you know are we uh, run by a committee are is there an owner or a director that you haven't met yet are we part of a, a chain or a group you know depending on your answer to that will probably depend on how you know structured your things like company values are um, you know they might be written down they might be shared with you by head office or they might be something that's not written down and it's more for you as the manager to just try and describe what what the kind of culture is of your organization you know what giving that background on the community that you serve that's another really important part of Absolutely. of any earlier setting of any size you know where you know the the person that's joining the team might live locally but they might not live particularly locally so it might be about explaining you know the the demographics the types of families that you're supporting any particular um standout features any particular prevalence of you know um, perhaps you live in an area where uh, a high a high portion of your families are forces families for example and, and giving people that top level background visibility first before you then get into the detail over the, the time that follows yeah oh I, I would definitely agree um i think that's really important and i think especially the piece at the beginning you know not just going powerpoint heavy two hours let's tell you anything and everything and introduce you to everyone uh, doing it in bite-sized chunks over a few days will really, really help. And that is a mixture of, you know, <clears throat> yes, conversations to a bit of self-learning to a bit of interactivity um, is really important. So yeah, 100% agree. And, and talking about um, as well as kind of culturally how you work and what your business stands for, and you could say your, your, your customer or your clients and um, what area you're in, um, <clears throat> Ways of working is then, you know, also important to introduce as well. Definitely. And that includes various things, you know, such as when do we catch up as a team? When do we like to have conversations? How do we communicate with each other? Do we have um, set times to communicate and do a briefing at the beginning of the day for the day ahead? Do we catch up at the end of the day? Do we do it on a weekly basis? Do we have um, socials as a team to get together and talk about anything and everything not related to work? That's normally the intention. And then we talk about everything related to work anyway. But um, yeah, talking about your your ways of working is also really important. Absolutely. And I think I'd pick up there again what you were saying about, you know, the person overall delivering that onboarding, not being someone's line manager. I absolutely agree with. And I think within a setting that can be a really empowering role to give to almost anyone in the team. It's not it's not about managing someone. It doesn't need to be someone with necessarily management responsibility. It can be someone who you know, perhaps the person in your team who is especially good at, you know, being friendly with grown ups. You know, it's not not always the case that the best uh, practitioners with earliest children are the best people with, you know, social skills and, and building new relationships with with new colleagues. So if there's someone in your team at any level who is really good at that, they might be the person who, you you know, you give that extra responsibility to, to take care of onboarding and, and welcoming new people. But I think it's also really valuable to remember that doesn't mean they have to do 100 percent of everything you know everyone's got their existing work that they need to do at, at the same time and that can be a real pressure so on that ways of working you know if you're if your setting uses any sort of technology if you use you know um uh, a digital learning journal or anything you know a, a, a digital system for register and and signing children in and those sorts of things again those are the perfect opportunities to to bring in another member of the team introduce them to yeah. someone else get them to go and sit down with with them and, and spend some time working through how that that tool works so that you've then got the time to go and you know get on with some of your other work um it, it that person being responsible for the onboarding overall is the person who's gonna you know do the 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 headlines is going to be the the main point of contact and crucially is going to be the one organizing it and keeping on top and making sure that people have done all of the elements but they don't have to deliver every last bit themselves um, and it can be a really good way of you know rather than just marching someone around the setting and saying that's so and so that's so and so that's so and so and it it just going over their heads it can be really nice to try and make an effort to uh, bring in various different colleagues that the person's going to work with anyway and introduce them on more of a one-to-one -one kind of natural basis while they're delivering some sort of some training or some information yeah you're, you're absolutely right sam i think having that person who assigned from boarding in the process uh, before um, to communicate with and potentially ask any additional questions to in advance and then having that really great introduction where this is the person they get to know who they can share things with and ask things, ask questions that they may not feel comfortable asking others um, at that point in time. And then ultimately that person doing check-ins almost throughout the day, 
So yeah. I think it's it, it's good for that person to deliver the first session, most definitely. But almost then they're acting as a making sure, obviously, the people who are coming in and being introduced are introduced and then um, having those check ins at the end of the day um, to see how they're feeling, what the key learnings were, any feedback they might have, because yeah. if you've built that personable relationship with that person pre and then at the beginning of the session, you will get that honest feedback about, you know, what what they are thinking. Um, yeah through throughout the period so and that, that absolutely. feedback element is really crucial to the way that we do it as well isn't it i know we 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 literally ask people to do a little survey um you know at, at the end of every uh, day of their onboarding their first few days because i think there's something really valuable about that fresh pair of eyes coming in um and you need to i think you need to be extra um insistent is maybe the wrong word extra encouraging to get people to to give honest feedback in their first couple of days because obviously they want to make a good impression and the last thing they want to do is be critical so you need to find a way to to enable someone to give honest feedback in a way that isn't going to make them uncomfortable and put them off but there's not there's much less point asking someone six months into a new job oh how was your first week when they're going to have forgotten and everything else is going to have colored their view since um so that that asking for feedback regularly um, and doing it in a way that's sensitive to the fact that they've just joined your team, I think it's really important. And that, that's another key reason why the manager should not be that person at yeah. the beginning and at the end of the day and doing those check-ins and in, in the lead up because you won't get the honest feedback or if you just bring in more senior people the whole time, yeah. um, you will just get, you're more than likely to just get yeses. How's yeah. everything going? Yeah, it's great, loving it. Um, whereas actually there might be something they're not comfortable with or something yeah. that you, that individual doesn't fully understand we can all relate to that i'm sure um but you you really need that relationship with that one crucial person some people do it as a buddy system but um you know i think if you can have that person in the build-up and throughout um you will get a lot more honest feedback and then it allows that individual who's owning the um onboarding and getting that feedback to be able to potentially adjust the structure um yeah. or bring that bring a person in who can answer those questions if they don't know the answers themselves um, definitely so yeah so we go so typically we'll do the old culture we'll do the the ways of working and then again we don't just dive into it uh, we don't dive into these are all the children this is everyone you need to meet we will then go into these are the tools you need to do your your day-to-day -day, uh, role um, so we'll take you through you know if you use a communication tool how you use it um, your regist registration tool that you mentioned, Sam, um, you know, how do you use that and who's responsible for that? Um, and, and that's typically the next thing we'll go through. And then maybe some headline um, policies as well that attribute to that are yeses and nos and really where to find them. So if you um, have a spool folder of documents with policies and standard operating procedures and all of that, uh, where they are and what to look for and what those points of contacts are. Um, so really the day one is all about getting to know that person who will take the feedback and gauge their understanding, culture and uh, ways of working, and then the tools you need on a day-to-day -day, um, to do the role. Um, and Absolutely. that's how, how we end day one. Um, typically, some other tips I would give definitely is <clears throat> Remember, when you join a new company, it can be very overwhelming. Um, there are so many things to take in, and there are always things that are, some things are the same, but some things are different. So between those that plan, make sure you have some solid breaks in between your sessions to process information, um, to think of any questions you might have before you go into introducing the next person and the next update from them. Um, those breaks are really, really important. Absolutely. I think as well, it's that um, you know, peculiar to, to not necessarily just early years, but, but certainly to any kind of um, education, health, social care uh, induction where some of those policies, policies are much more statutory that people just do have to read them and quite often have to sign to say that they've read them. Um, you know, approaching that in a, um, a an engaging way, you know, rather than just sitting someone down with you know, that, that stack of 10 policies that they just have to read, maybe, you know, breaking it up throughout the day so that perhaps, you know, they, before each 15 minute break, they spend 15 minutes reading the next couple of policies. Um, and, and yeah, again, thinking about how you would like to do it, whether you would like to sit and just 
churn through them all in one go, it's less likely to, to really go in. Um, is worth worth bearing in mind as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, on on day we we typically then do a, a day two as well. Um, yeah. Our it kind of detailed induction is over the first two days. Um, how joining on joining the business, um, but that second day is then really getting to know people in other areas of the business. Um, so, for example, if you join, um, let's say you were you were joining a setting and you have. Um, let's say you have someone who does your marketing or potentially does your social media, it might be allocated to someone in your individual setting or it might be someone outside. But I think it's always nice and I think it's always really relevant for long term um, to introduce those people that maybe you wouldn't work with on a day-to-day -day basis because let's say you're in a setting that is struggling um, and you have no idea what's going on to, you know, um, increase the number of children in your own setting. I think it's great to know the person who actually um, creates, you know, that plan or or does the posting and how they do it and why they do it and what they're working on. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I've seen think... lots of people leave businesses where they haven't met those people, and ultimately they will just say, "We don't have any marketing. We don't have a social media presence. It's always wrong, and I would do it this way." And normally yeah. that comes down to not having built a relationship or understanding what's being promoted when and why, as an example. Yeah. And I think particularly in, in nursery settings, you know, in group group based settings where you've got often different rooms, it, we've all experienced it where it's that it, it's very easy to get quite territorial. Um, yeah. And, and it's if your induction straight away focuses just on the immediate group of colleagues that someone's going to work with, it's very easy for a new person to just sort of fall into those those bad habits, those those patterns, when actually someone new coming in can be a really great opportunity to break down some of that um, tension or friction that can exist between different groups of staff. So for me, a great example, similar to what, what Ed was talking about there, is around food provision. If you've got a chef in your nursery, lots of lots of settings will have a chef. You know, get someone to go and spend, you know, it doesn't need to be a whole half day, maybe just get them to spend, you know, the, the hour leading up to and, and serving lunch on their, their second day or something so that they can spend some time, they can you know, meet the chef, realise that they're not a, you know, big scary person that no one must ever go and talk to um, and and see how they approach meals, see what they're serving, see how they make it. Um, because otherwise, again, that a bit like the social media example there, it's very easy to, you know, I don't know, get frustrated that lunch is late being served or that, um, you know, the meals aren't what you expected them to be. That actually, if you've just had that, that insight and you've made that personal connection, it can really help um, get people off on the right foot. Yeah, I, I think another example, that's a really good example. And then another one I'd give that's probably quite relevant is who is writing those policies and those standard operating procedures. So if that that individual who writes them is sitting outside the specific setting you're working in um, or uh, is working in a head office or office environment, it is so important that as part of your onboarding, you have interaction with them and understand maybe why things are written the certain way they are or having the ability to ask questions then and there or having the ability to ask questions in the future. So if I go back to, I worked, uh, when I was in the travel industry, I worked for Thomas Cook and the Cooperative Travel, and we had um, around 1,300 retail outlets. And the biggest challenge I had from a sales, from a communications, and from an operations perspective was trying to make people feel that they were part of something bigger than just the shop they're in. And you tend to find when you're in a retail environment or a setting environment um, that you are in that bubble in your own setting and you're on your own as a setting, but actually you are part of a much wider team. And there's a lot of conversations going on around your standard operating procedures and how it works, or maybe testing those policies out in another setting um, before it goes live in your own setting. So if you don't have those if you don't include those interactions as part of your onboarding i promise you you will create headaches down the road because they will not be happy about something or i've yeah. done it this way and that was the right way and actually if you've created that connection where you understand why already or you've got the ability to ask why or the ability to feed back to that person in an operation or in a marketing perspective or maybe even in a finance perspective depending on your yeah your your role in the setting um it, it is so important and you'll only create i promise worse productivity and negativity and moans and groans and conversations about why things are wrong 
and your way yeah. and their way is better so um day two is very much about building relationships understanding where each team is who that key contact is and why maybe some of the big things have been done the way they have yeah um so then, yeah that's how then, day two to be honest absolutely and then i think going from uh, you know from day two onwards for us yeah uh, at tnl and i think it's something we'd recommend generally that's kind of the point that the handover happens to the person's line manager so whether that's yeah. you know the nursery manager or whether it's their room leader or whoever it might be that once those kind of first two foundational days have been done that's the point that they you know go and sort of join their team whatever that team is um and they they sort of actually get get to work um what yeah what what are the kind of the last the last piece of the puzzle um on that you know their first days and weeks but having done those first days those first two days yeah. so they finished the second day they've had their final feedback with let's say that that kind of buddy and they're going into the team on their first day with their manager the the key is is to make sure again that there is a plan um so don't ruin it when they go in for day day one in their team yeah not just completely throwing them in the deep end and undoing the hard work you've done already. Again, make sure there is a bit of a phased plan, getting to know a particular area, feedback, questions, getting to know another area, feedback, questions, and um, definitely buddy them up with someone um, yeah. in, in a setting is really important to ask some of those questions again that they might not want to ask um, a manager or, or a leader in that area. And then have um, some set times to make sure you can have conversations with that team member, feedback, see how they're getting on. And at, at the beginning, you have to do that on a daily basis, maybe at the beginning and maybe at the, the end as well. Because remember, at the end of the day, you, you've got um, three different type of learners and a lot of people will reflect and they won't have feedback at the end of the day. But the next morning, they will have reflected on their whole day, talked about it maybe with their partner or their dog or cat at home. <laughs> And, um, you know, they'll want to chat through some of their thoughts or concerns or questions. Yeah. So feedback with them, um, feedback is really important. The buddy is really important. And then as you go into the weeks, I think drawing up, you know, the expectations, um, expectations of the role and understanding what those strengths and weaknesses are. So, you know, uh, the industry standard in any business is a skills matrix. And the idea of that is really to, um, list everything that a person could do in their role and get them to grade themselves red amber green on how comfortable they feel about doing it red i'm not comfortable in the slightest yellow i'm um i could do it but i'm not that confident but i can i can definitely do it mm. and green i'm super confident and i could do it on a day-to-day -day basis and yeah. again that it's another tool that will provoke some great conversations and development from a training perspective to getting them to the role ultimately you drew up initially. And I think it's really key when you're doing that as well to be quite um, uh, precise, you know, so so not just writing kind of generic and um, wide ranging statements about, you know, I don't know, engaging with parents, for example, try and break that down into what does that actually, what, what are the tasks that someone's going to have to do? So, Absolutely. you know, how confident do you feel um, having, you know, answering the phone? How confident do you feel dealing with parents at the door? How confident do you feel sending emails to parents if that's something that you do in your setting and separate it out because you're you're likely to have someone who you know either is you know very confident talking on the phone but is quite nervous about their spelling or grammar if they're sending an email or the other way around there's someone who really doesn't like answering the phone hasn't had to do it and doesn't feel very confident but is quite happy to to send an email to someone um you know identifying early on those those little gaps, those areas that someone lacks confidence in, that they're they're going to tell you they lack confidence in, so that you can support them to to gain gain confidence in the the tasks that they they need to do. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really important, and actually, you know, if, if it's not something you do with Skills Matrix, um, with you know, let's say new members of the team, it's actually a great exercise to do with your entire team. Get everyone to be uh, like Sam said. It has to be task based. It's got to be crystal clear, specific uh, task. But get people to rate themselves on the skills Definitely. matrix, and then ultimately, as a their leader or manager, have the conversation with them about that and see where they score. And you will identify some areas that you potentially don't even know about um, that are maybe pitfalls. So that if someone left, 
um, you would actually be really exposed in one area because you'd have nobody who is specifically that confident in doing this or that yeah. great at doing that task. So um, recommend doing that for all the team if you haven't already. For the new joiners, 100% it's a must do. And ultimately, it's a great way for you to measure their confidence as well because um, another month later, ask them to do it again and compare yeah. the two and see have you have they progressed in their confidence in doing these tasks um, and has your development plan for them to be doing the role that you've agreed the budget for them to do um, are they doing it and yes. are you getting what you need from them um, so that's really crucial and then ultimately these feedback conversations you know if you spot something that's not right feed it back then and there don't wait don't sit on it don't wait for a probation period review meeting don't wait for a whatever you have a six month yeah. meeting 12 month meeting or no meeting um have the feedback um yeah. then and there and then monitor the progression uh, up until they hit that kind of one to three month probation period it's really important Absolutely. definitely well we've we've been talking ed for nearly an hour non-stop so we're coming up towards the end of our time is there anything else that that you wanted to to cover off any kind of last top tips that you wanted to share I think my last thing would be, and that's gone really fast. Um, mm -hmm. my, my last thing would be is um, think about the impact if you don't do anything we've just talked about. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in summary, the impact is you can lose talent very quickly if you don't do this. If you do not prepare or you think, gosh, I've got this person joining tomorrow. What am I going to start? I'll get them shadow Lauren yeah. for the day. Um, I promise you the way they feel and the productivity that will come out of that will be so low and so poor that potentially you'll either they'll hang on in the role, but it'll take you forever to, for them to get to where they need to be um, or they'll move on. Yeah. And so onboarding is a very crucial step in retaining talent and ultimately driving the productivity and achieving the goal as to why you've actually put this role out and advertised it. So mm -hmm. don't underestimate how powerful and what a key part of the recruitment process onboarding is absolutely and i think um the the last kind of thought on this for for me is that onboarding is um a lot more work to to prepare than some of the other stages that we've talked about but crucially it, it stays the same you know when we've been yeah. talking about planning you know re recruitment when we've talked about writing job adverts and job descriptions and doing interviews and, and all the planning associated with that that has to be done every time you're recruiting for a role and obviously mm -hmm. you'll get a bit quicker, but you have to do it for each time. With onboarding, this is something that, yes, you might need to set aside, you know, a, a decent block of time and, and get various of your team involved to get it set up. And certainly the first time you'll do it, there'll be various things you want to change for the second time you do it. But once you're into the swing of it, it it's going to stay pretty much the same. There's not going to be a load of work show every time. It's going to be a standard, you know, uh, a standard schedule that everyone who joins goes through the same sort of pattern and the people delivering it will be really confident and will be really familiar with it. And it's it's something that, particularly with the summer holidays coming up, you know, that's always a quieter period for settings, whether they're open or not. But it's a great opportunity over those six weeks to really make this a project so that from the start of the new school year in September, you've got, you know, those those onboarders ready who aren't necessarily the managers. You've got those schedules, you've got those, you know, that video made, you've got that email template that you send out to everyone the week before they do their first day all of those things that we've talked about and that the chapter in the ultimate guide goes through in in lots more detail really it's like i said it's really worth investing in getting that up and running because once it's there it's something you can use all the time without um, a huge amount of extra effort yeah and if you have a hr tool or don't have a hr tool yet um typically there are a few pounds a month per, yeah. per employee um you can load all of these in so you can say from the moment I have entered this person's name into the HR system, they're joining on this date and it will send you or the person who's in charge of onboarding reminders each time there's something to send or it can send it free of charge for you. Yeah. So you can, yes, it is a cycle and yes, it, it doesn't really change, which is great. The hard work is up front, like Sam said, but um, there are tools out there that you can get that cycle going almost Absolutely. automatically for you. Definitely. OK, brilliant. Well, with that, we have remarkably come, come to the end already. Um, so uh, thank you Ed, very much for your time this morning and for, for all of your input into this uh, chapter of the guide as well. Um, it's been yeah great 
great conversation. I think it'll be really useful for, for everyone. Um, we will be back uh, next Monday um, for our next session, which we will be back to being live. Um, and next week we will be looking at uh, employment law, looking at issues of inclusivity and diversity, um, and taking that sort of much broader look at the whole recruitment process as a whole that we've covered over the week so far and how we can make sure that's uh, compliant with the law, but also reflecting best practice and the best um, attitude to make sure that the team is uh, as good as it can be. And so we hope you'll be able to join us then for our next uh, live session. Um, and with that, goodbye. Cool.